My name is William Jefferson Black. I'm the publisher of Transaction Advisors and the host of our M&A Methods interview series. Welcome to the latest edition. I'm pleased to be here today with Andrew Gratz, the Associate General Counsel at Lion Del Basel. And this is part of our M&A interview series where we discuss and debate techniques and methods in mergers and acquisitions and the structuring of complex corporate transactions. Um, this conversation is coming to you from the Wharton San Francisco campus where we've just wrapped up a two-day conference on M&A planning, structuring, and execution. And it's part of our M&A conference series which also takes place in New York at Fordham Law School and in September at the University of Chicago. So Andrew, if you could give us, a, a, first of all, an overview of the company and then let's talk about your role. Sure, William, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, Lion Up a Cell was formed at the end of 2007 and about a year later filed for bankruptcy, still today one of the largest bankruptcies in U.S. history. After 15 months we emerged and um, I joined a few months before we filed for bankruptcy, so I had that um, incredible experience which I'm sure we'll talk about a, a little later. Today, after taking on numerous roles at the company, uh, I am today the Associate General Counsel for Commercial and Strategic Transactions which means my team is responsible for all the mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, joint ventures globally, and all of our commercial sales in the Americas. Now, I understand the Financial Times uh, recognized the team's success and contribution to partnering well with the business. Um, well, quite a prestigious recognition, I think. Thank, thank you. No, it was a, uh, an honor that we were very happy to receive and very humbled to receive, and it's a, it's a credit to the entire team. So let's start uh, talking about the team and, yeah. and the process because one of the things that I've heard you talk about at our M&A conferences is the partnership with the business and the legal team and how you found that process to be effective when there's close collaboration. But let's talk more specifically, how, how does that really work and where are the touch points that you find are most critical? No, thank you for the question. It's interesting because before I went to law school, I ran political campaigns. And throughout a campaign, you have one goal and one goal only to get the candidate elected. And I brought that uh, focus on the end goal to my legal practice and to line up a cell. And so the starting point is what are we trying to accomplish? What is the goal of the transaction? Um, the team is, hears me say all the time, if you don't understand the why, you can't effectively develop the how. And so to ensure alignment between business, legal, tax, finance, we sit down and figure out why are we doing this transaction. And every time we meet, we focus on that over and over again. Are we still on the same path? Does the transaction still make sense for our strategy? And how are we negotiating, discussing, engaging with this, trans with this particular transaction to advance the company's strategic goals? Now, the balance, though, of risk and reward from the transaction is such a natural tension that exists between you and the business team. You know, clearly they have a business objective they're trying to advance, and you have a, uh, an important responsibility to the shareholders and to the board to protect the organization from risk. It, walk us through some of the ways that that relationship has been uh, organized and how it works well and what, what's been uh, really optimal in terms of that relationship balancing risk and reward. Now, I'm glad you described it as a natural tension, and I would say it's a healthy one, that the biz business has one goal, has the reward in mind, and legal has the risk in mind. Lawyers see risk everywhere. It's, we're built that way. We're, we're designed that way. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The average lawyer will only see risk, and the average business person will only see reward. And so what we have at Lined Up a Cell, and what I encourage every team to have, are excellent, business and legal team members because the excellent team members see the risk and the reward. And that's where it comes down to having a team in place that appreciates the risk while striving to achieve that reward. And we constantly have that discussion of are we striking that right balance? Sure. And that is a tension that um, sometimes leads to, I'll say, animated conversations <laughs> and some disagreements, but a healthy respectful difference that we, because we both have the same goal in mind sure. to ensure the company sure. succeeds. So uh, layering in a, another level of tension is the time pressure. Yeah. 
And the time pressure to get deals done when you're competing in a competitive auction, when you're competing with financial buyers that have a very low threshold of uh, risk um, uh, diligence. And as you're moving through a deal cycle in the real world, not just the theoretical that we might discuss at, at the Wharton campus here, uh, there are any number of agreements that need to be diligenced and studied for risk. Uh, how do you find that that process can balance the comprehensive desired nature of diligence and yet the tension to move very, very quickly and get the deal done? You, have, you have obviously have to prioritize. Uh, my view is diligence is key. Big deal, small deal, it doesn't matter. You, under, you have to understand what you're buying. Now, you, you've pointed out an, ex, you pointed out an excellent uh, concern. Time crunch, how do you look at every single agreement? I go back to you know, something we talked about a little earlier. What is the goal of the transaction? If the goal of the tra that should be driving diligence. That should be driving the, the negotiations. So for example, if the goal of the transaction is to acquire a certain IP, well, if the target owns a few warehouses, I really don't care, care maybe how many square feet the warehouses may be. Um, if the, you know, I was in Disneyland recently, and it was clear Disney, when they were buying LucasArts, cared if they could sell Darth Vader toys. They didn't care if Lucas Films had a fleet of Mercedes or Fords. What is the goal of the transaction? So if it's an IP transaction, I'm scrubbing those licenses, making sure we're fully protected. If the goal is uh, to acquire cer certain key personnel, what, what are their employment, looks like, employment agreements look like? Do they have covenants not to compete? How long can I ensure these employees stay with uh, the acquirer? The strategy drives the diligence. And so when you have to prioritize, you just come back to the strategy. And that will guide you. Sure. So focusing on the strategy and focusing on the key value driver sounds like the, the, you know, the first step forward. But of course, the one that can never be left behind is the compliance obligations, the anti-corruption diligence. And, and obviously, you bring expertise in that area as well and have pretty deep experience in dealing with compliance and anti-corruption uh, risk. Um, how has that process changed? Because I think the scrutiny is quite a bit higher these days. Very right? much so. Uh, you look at the fines recently, multi-billion dollar fines for anti-corruption, antitrust, data privacy, all areas I'm very familiar with. So that is also an issue we are constantly uh, um, looking out for, especially as we're looking at emerging markets. Well, certain emerging markets have anti-corruption issues. Have we addressed that risk? Have we fully vetted our potential partners? Because once, you know, through an acquisition or a joint venture, there is certain success or liability. And we need to be, we need to fully appreciate and understand what we're getting ourselves into. And I trust is another example. Um, the European Union and other um, air countries of the world and regions of the world are getting, are, are becoming far more um, rigorous mm -hmm. in how they look at certain transactions and concerns whether or not monopolies or duopolies are forming. And so we need to be aware, is there a risk that we may have to divest assets? And if we have to divest assets, are those the assets we're actually looking to acquire? And of course, data privacy, which um, is not going away. You see the issues Facebook, uh, Google, and others are facing. Well, every company that does business in Europe has personal data, whether it's their employees, their customers, their vendors. We need to be comfortable that the target has handled that data appropriately and consistent with our values. Thank you to our underwriter Interlinks. From IPOs to spin-offs, restructurings, and mergers and acquisitions, Interlinks provides a best-in-class platform for your next transaction. The depth of the experiences that you've had in looking at a lot of deals and ultimately consummating a number of deals um, it has probably led you to have a little bit of a personal due diligence checklist, maybe some items that don't appear in the standard um, playbook for diligence, but some that you found in your experience are really unique and important to identify. Could you share a few of those with us? Absolutely. Um, the, th the issue that I th think unfortunately gets forgotten is culture. So when we're looking at a target, you, you have the financial diligence, the legal diligence, the tax diligence, but will these employees understand our culture? Will they value safety the way we value safety? Will they value operational excellence the way we value it? Those are issues we need to be concerned about because the day after closing, 
these employees are running our plants. These employees are representing our company, our reputation. And so I'm a very big believer and advocate. We need to understand the culture of the target and whether or not they will fit in to what we believe and our values. That's interesting. And I think you probably give me a good segue because I was also curious to ask you about the relationship post-close and how you set the tone for the culture and the relationships you're going to have in particular with key management where that starts right after what could be a contentious negotiation through the deal process. And you talked earlier about engaging the business in early in the process and in the negotiation, but a contentious deal negotiation could lead to a strained culture post-close. Uh, do you insulate the business from some of those issues? Do you play the tough uh, role sometimes to, to ensure a better post-close environment and relationship? No, I think it's a best practice that the lawyers are on the front lines. Let us you know, withstand the arrows and the spears mm -hmm. and the bullets um, because for two reasons. One, if things need to be escalated, let it go. Let management be the good guy that tries to save the deal on both sides. Moreover, especially in a JV relationship, mm -hmm. once you close, you're not done. In fact, you may be looking at 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 year relationship. You don't want to start that off on the wrong foot. And so let the lawyer be the bad guy. Um, I always like telling our business team, I'm happy to be the bad guy. I'm comfortable doing it. I want you to be the, be the good guy. And so we t typically do that because we want our business team to be in the best position possible when the deal closes, whether it's an acquisition or a joint venture relationship. Yeah, well, and it sounds like the refinements to the process are as important as the substance of the deal documents. And, and to the deal documents, let's focus on those for a few minutes. Um, let's talk about the construction of the deal documents and how you start to think, first of all, about deal structure. Because um, you mentioned joint ventures, which, which piqued my interest in an issue that you've served on the faculty here at the M&A Conference at Warren San Francisco to talk about the merits and the challenges of joint venture structures. And stepping back, how do you think about the right deal structure and the formation then of the, the, the deal terms that, that ensue? Going back to what I said earlier, and I know I'm possibly sounding like a broken record, but what are you trying to achieve? Because you really can't discuss deal structure until you know what you're trying to achieve. And so if you're looking to uh, have access to a market well, a JV may be, be, your, be, be your best vehicle, but if you're looking to just extract money, then maybe a JV is not. Um, and maybe investing in that, um, in that country or in that region may not be your best uh, way to advance that strategic goal. So that's really what it comes down to. What, which vehicles, because there are many. There, there is the typical JV where you form an entity, a partnership. There is, um, in our business, offtake agreements, feedstock agreements, different agree uh, relationship agreements whereby we can sort of dip our toes in the water see what's uh, see how um, we can develop a stronger relationship with this other party see if they're reliable see if they share our values and then as time goes by we can have a more um, rigorous discussion on whether or not we want to strengthen that relationship or abandon it you know, a big focus of what we aim to do with transaction advisors and being a, a journal on transaction process and, and, and methods is look at where the theoretical uh, best practice exists, where the real world exists, and how one might bridge those gaps and considerations. Where are the, what are the deal points that you find most often deviate from what would be ideal in the best practice scenario to what really gets negotiated out in, in the real world? Where are the biggest areas of divergence? I, my, really, everything but price. And I say that because um, you, I think it's pretty typical for the corporate development teams to be very focused on price, as well they should be. But the agreement isn't one page. And the, even the issues outside the agreement are not contained in that one page. The culture issues I just highlighted. What protections does one have after closing? And it starts with diligence. Do we understand what we're buying? Because even if the agreement has all the protections in the world, you have to go to court to enforce it. You may have rights, but you have the remedy. Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I try to um, discuss with my team is let's figure out what we're buying. Let's pretend the agreement doesn't exist. 
are we comfortable acquiring this asset, this business, assuming no, there are no legal protections because it may, depending on the jurisdiction or the, or the um, issues involved, it may take 10 to 15 years to get that money back after you've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on legal fees. So let's be comfortable with the asset we're buying and at that point discuss price because other, other issues sort of fall by the wayside. It's such an interesting framework to, to set aside the agreement entirely as almost a theoretical exercise, but a very applied and practical one because it gets you anchored around the value drivers of the deal. That's, that's pretty interesting. I don't think we've, we've come across anyone using that, that method. Um, and can you talk, talk as well about when you look at a deal at the onset, are, are you able to anticipate the tension points in a way that informs the way they are discussed at the onset? Or does each deal negotiation take a totally separate and unique uh, path in which it's hard to anticipate until the first responses come through where the tension points will be? From a legal perspective, you have the typical tension points, indemnification, warranty, but every deal has its own unique issues. If you're acquiring a family-owned business, that CEO, that founder, takes it personally. This is his company, this is her baby. And so how you address those me issues, uh, how you address the employees that CEO may have hired 20, 30 years ago, and how you treat them with respect is going to be different than the, global, uh, the national conglomerate. And so you have to come to each, uh, approach each deal and understand its unique qualities. Right. So let's talk about qualities and characteristics of a good negotiator. Yeah. Um, Let's start negative, though. Sure. Worst characteristic of someone negotiating a deal? The arrogant person who is difficult for the sake of being difficult. Mm -hmm. And so I think whether it's our personal lives or professional lives, we've been across the table from that person who pounds his chest, yeah. who slams her, her fist, who just wants to be the pit bull in the room. And frankly, it's a disservice yeah. to their uh, company and to their shareholders, because that pit bull probably is treating his or her own, own people horribly. Right. So they're not fully engaged. And frankly, by be acting that way, they're demonstrating their insecurity. And if I'm on the other side of that person, I can exploit that insecurity over and over again. And so I try to avoid those people. That's interesting, yeah. That, uh, well, let's flip the question now. Um, what about characteristics of an effective deal negotiator? The calm in the storm. The person who is professional, under, look, deals are late nights, long hours, high stress, but I want the person in the room doesn't get bothered, doesn't get flustered, just understands this is why I'm here, this is what I'm here to achieve, doesn't take anything personally, and treats everyone, whether it's on his or her side of the table or across the table, with professionalism and respect. Mm. It's interesting. Uh, to that as you get to the end of, of those days and nights at the table. Yeah. Um, t tell me about it throughout as you reflect on your career. Best compliment as you wrapped up the deal that uh, was ever uh, shared with you. When both sides told me they got what they wanted. Interesting. Yeah. Both sides. Both sides. I didn't expect that was going to be your answer. Yeah. That's a great best compliment yeah. ever. All right, another fun one. Best closing dinner. So I mentioned a few minutes ago the bankruptcy. And so after 15 months, you had a group of people who had done everything possible to ensure the company survived. And so at this bankruptcy dinner, still today the largest one I've ever attended, close to 100 people, because we wanted to recognize everybody. Why be exclusive when you're celebrating success? And so it's still today uh, a, a, a night I have fond memories of. That's interesting. You've, uh, you've shared some, some interesting wisdom with us. Let me, let me just try an open-ended question. Um, if you finish this uh, sentence for me. Sure. Always remember... The deal is not the end. It's a means to the end. Interesting. Interesting. I think we get so focused on the deal process and the deal terms that uh, it's probably rare that we step back and have the perspective that the end goal isn't just to close right. and to win, but it's really to add value with the business. So I think that's a great way to finish the conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much for your thoughts. Really Appreciate it. it. Thank you.
Thanks again to our underwriter Interlinks, the leading virtual data room provider who supports 99% of the Fortune 1000 companies. From deal preparation, diligence, right through to closing, find out more at interlinks.com. Thank you.